Today we are joined by uh, Dr. Uh, Ritesh Kumar, who is an assistant professor of uh, computational linguistics um, uh, at the Department of Linguistics at Dr. Bimrao Embatkar uh, University in Accra, India. I, I probably pronounced that completely wrong. Um, sorry and, uh, for that. Um, he's also the co coordinator of the um, Master of Science program in computational linguistics at the Center for Transdisciplinary Studies, as well as being a fellow of the Council for Strate Strategic and Defense Research, New Delhi, where he has established and leads a specialized division on artificial intelligence and linguistics for several years. And his research interests lie broadly at the intersection of pragmatic social linguistics and computational linguistics. And um, he's involved in various projects, both nationally and internationally. Um, I think today he is going to talk about um, bridging, bridging the gap between natural language processing and field linguistics. And his, the title of his talk is um, Field Linguistics and NLP, Can They Be Friends? So um, without further ado, uh, I welcome Dr. Kumar, and uh, feel free to share your screen or start your talk. Thank you, Richard, and thank you everyone for inviting me for this. Uh, thanks a lot for your generous introduction. I hope I'm audible. Yes, we can hear you. Well, I can hear you at least. Yeah. So I just shared the screen. Yeah, yeah it's visible. Yeah. Okay, so let me start. Okay, so as Chiodar mentioned, uh, I would be talking. Uh, so it's, it's, okay, so there, there are a couple of things that I just want to say at the outset. It's going to be a very, very um, theoretical and boring talk in the sense that it's, it's not really philosophical, but very theoretical in the sense that I won't be talking a lot about uh, a lot about the experiments, etc. But it's more like a, a setting the stage kind of talk. So uh, probably at the end of it, it will feel like it was just introduction. So uh, I hope that that uh, will work. Okay. So let's uh, ah Theodore, just to confirm. So I have uh, how much time do I have? Well, we, we, we schedule uh, about an hour for this talk. So I suppose maybe 45 minutes or something. And then we have 10 or 15 minutes for questions, I suppose, something like that. If sure, you want to, sure. if you wanted to shorten it a bit to 35, 40 minutes, that's fine too. It, it, it's up to you. Great. And if, if in case I keep on talking a lot, just please feel free to intervene and tell me to stop. So, uh, yeah, I don't want to go uh, beyond 45 minutes. Okay, so let's start with an introduction to field linguistics. And I was not sure if uh, if there would be a lot of people in the audience who are already aware of this. So I just uh, prepared a couple of slides on this. Now, if you are, if you already know what field linguistics is, then I could give it a skip. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll just start and let me uh, let me know if it's it's going. To, a little bit too introductory. So uh, to begin with an introduction to the field uh, itself in the in the phrase field linguistics. So generally, uh, field refers to the physical location where a large number of the speakers of a specific language reside. And um, when we talk about field linguistics, they are talking about collecting data from a location, which is generally not cosmopolitan city. It's a, rural location, but doesn't have to be. Uh, also that traditionally the speakers of the language reside in those places and it's mostly a monolingual area, monolingual community, so to say, uh, that resides there. Uh, in, in the sense that speakers of various languages are generally not found in that one location. Now, uh, so those are the general and so in that sense collecting data from anywhere generally doesn't count as as doing field linguistics uh, traditionally again field linguistics has focused on the process of you know 
probably documenting and describing language uh, based on primary data that had been collected from the field. Right? The end goal uh, was always to produce uh, grammatical descriptions, mostly grammatical descriptions, but also to have other outputs such as building dictionaries and lexicon and also you know the other ancillary uh, materials that people prepare using these uh, uh, using the data that has been collected. Uh, more recently, uh, especially in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, there is also uh, an emerging field which is um, loosely called documentary linguistics. And that focuses on capturing linguistic data in all its different domains of uses. Now, this uh, this came up in the in the context of mostly endangered languages, where the the number of speakers are depleting fast, and there is a there is a chance that language will no longer be spoken, say in the next uh, twenty years, thirty years, maybe in the next fifty years or so. So, in that situation, the uh, linguists try and you know, uh, have uh, data for that language documented in 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 all its diversity or as much diversity as is possible. And the the idea is that if at some point the community or the researchers, if they would want to revitalize the language, if they would want to start using it again at some point, this data could be utilized for that purpose. And and that's why the there is this. Uh, uh, focus on comprehensive documentation of the language. Now, irrespective of uh, what uh, what's the end goal, whether it's to document the language or to write specific grammatical descriptions, there are uh, there are some characteristics, some features that uh, you know uh, all listed. There are some methods that has been used by the by the linguists for getting those kind of data. So uh, these are things like there is a lot of focus on questionnaires and prompts that could collect different types of linguistic data. So um, a good, uh, of course, good quality, but also a representative data set, representative in various terms, including uh, representation of various different kinds of uh, linguistic structures, because we could see ultimately the goal is to get the, uh, get the descriptive grammar of the language. And also the field has developed a lot of best practices that relate to you know, approaching the speakers, how to recruit them, uh, how to conduct the whole process of data collection, what are the ethical considerations that probably one need to have while going to the field and getting data from the community. Also, there's a lot of discussion around whose data ultimately it is. So, uh, I mean, so there's this general understanding that data always belongs to the community. Uh, as researchers, we are only using their data. So irrespective of, you know, how we collect and how we use it, the data ultimately belongs to them. So there's a lot of uh, focus on that aspect as well. So uh, some of the, uh, I would say the highlights of field methods, some of the things which characterize uh, what we call uh, field methods of data collection. In uh, So the first thing that probably it includes is uh, there has to be an elicitation tool, some kind of elicitation tool uh, in the form of questionnaires or, or uh, there is also uh, this uh, tradition of what, what we could call the immersion in the community method where uh, linguists go and live with the community for for several months, maybe years as well, to learn their language, to learn their culture and uh, then start analyzing the the language. Now, uh, there has been a lot of uh, debate on this, which is the superior method. So a lot of linguists would say that elicitation using questionnaires is, is quicker and one could get down to writing the description, producing other outputs rather quickly. But uh, the, the other side would say that uh, ethically it's superior to be with the community, to, to, to know about them, to learn about them, and then try and analyze it. Also, uh, more practically, it turns out that using elicitation methods, uh, we miss out a lot of different kinds of linguistic structures. So those are not collected. It's not possible to collect this, especially when you know we are trying to use questionnaires which are in a language where, where the grammatical structures present in the other language is not there. So you know uh, you cannot really elicit by by any kind of prompt. Uh, 
both has its own sets of challenges, of course. So immersion, as you could see, it's not always possible to 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 live in the community for months uh, at a time, and it requires significantly large number of resources. Now, the second uh, thing is so, irrespective of which method we use, ultimately there's some kind of elicitation tool that we are uh, using at some point in collecting data from the field. The second one is, as I mentioned earlier, as well that the data has to be uh, that data tends to be uh, diverse, both in terms of languages that are represented, in the sense that uh, a large number of uh, languages have been studied within the uh, within the broader field of field linguistics, uh, but also in terms of the grammatical structures that are represented in the data, and more recently the domains of use that is represented there, especially in the in the documentary linguistics. Uh, the third thing, the data is uh, that ultimately that data that is generated tends to be uh, highly organized, uh, rather accurately transcribed, and they're marked with rich grammatical information. Now, uh, they are interlinearly linearly glossed data, which means that we have a lot of morphological level information present in the data. And but at the same time, this makes it an extremely slow and resource intensive process, uh, which results in high quality data. But uh, the problem is that the size of the data that we ultimately get is not really large. So data quantity that if we look at uh, for most of the outputs from the uh, field linguistics is that it ranges from a few hundred to a few thousand sentences in, in, in most of the cases. So there could be some exceptions. Uh, uh, so the the big challenges, as as uh, one one could see here, is that there's this uh, iterative time taking process and uh, of uh, transcription and interlinear glossing, also collecting the data, and there's very little. Uh, uh, help for field linguists that is available in automating these. Generally, the uh, automation applications, the NLP applications that are available are not accessible for non-NLP researchers. It's more uh, so for field linguists because they're ultimately working on languages which has, uh, which is most likely unexplored till then. Uh, the second is, of course, also that the uh, way data is stored and data is managed, it varies uh, across institutions, across researchers, because uh, there are not very many standardized way of uh, storing that data. Okay, so uh, probably one of the uh, first things that would come to mind that might be of help is, is uh, trying to automate some of those task that linguists, uh, that field linguists do. So transcription is, of course, uh, you know, we could try and have a such systems, uh, especially uh, for the language, if the language, you know, already has uh, some kind of data available, then one could have uh, some kind of ASR system for doing the transcription. For interlinear glossing, uh, so uh, this year, Sigmorphone has a shared task on, on interlinear glossing, but in general, uh, uh, NLP does not really talk about interlinear glossing as interlinear glossing. It could be something like morphological analyzer, which uh, which could be employed for doing uh, automated interlinear glossing. Also, uh, uh, there uh, is this uh, need of an easy to use application that does uh, a lot of things actually. So that uh, helps in managing the data, keeping the data in a structured format to begin with. Also, uh, something which uh, helps uh, in integrating the state of the art NLP systems uh, without the need to fiddle with commands or extensive documentation. So it's something, uh, it's something which uh, field linguists would probably not want to spend their time with. So an easy to use thing is what uh, they're looking for and uh, possibly uh, and uh, we probably have some of this but not uh, really in a, in, in a way that could be used by field linguists so possibly some kind of a, uh, an application that would also allows for training um, 
baseline NLP systems in a in a in a no code environment, right? So we don't, uh, of course, we cannot expect everyone working with the language to be aware of how to train a uh, train an ML model, for example, or or, or fine tune a pre trained model. So those are the kind of things that we cannot expect. So uh, no code environment is what uh, what could be of uh, help. Now, uh, so from the other uh, side of the things, so why is it, uh, 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 or let's say how uh, field linguistics could probably be of help uh, for NLP. So uh, I just give some context here and uh, I'll talk mostly in terms of, uh, mostly in, in Indian context. So uh, if we look at, uh, let's, let's try and look, look at the linguistic diversity of India and how far uh, we have gone. And I would say that the situation uh, is not unique to India. So neither the linguistic diversity nor uh, the linguistic diversity in NLP. And it's, it's, it's kind of getting highlighted uh, in the last couple of years a lot. So uh, if we look at this chart, uh, you see that uh, India has these three groups of languages. Uh, so there are uh, languages which are cons which are listed in the Indian constitution. They are called scheduled languages. And then we have a large number of languages which are uh, not listed in the constitution, but they are listed in the census. And then we have this last group of uh, 1,000, more than 1,000 languages, which have less than 10,000 speakers. And these are the languages uh, which are neither listed in the constitution nor are they named in the census. So these are the languages which census says that they exist, but it's not named there. And if we look at the number of speakers, of course, uh, the proportion is uh, just diverse. So the 22 uh, languages in the schedule have uh, I spoken by almost 75% of the speakers in India. Okay, so, uh, but then we also have, uh, you know, these thousand, uh, or languages which are spoken by by a relatively smaller population rather small population now if we look at the number of languages that are represented in our uh, uh, in our multilingual pre-trained models and uh, sometimes they are also called massively multilingual but clearly uh, i mean they could be massively multilingual from the perspective of how nlp has progress till now but not more generally, right? So if you look at this, uh, the first two are the you know, are two of the first pre-trained models and which, which I still used uh, in a lot of applications. So we'll see that uh, in all, in both of these, the only Indian languages that are represented are the, are the scheduled languages. Also, there are two, um, Muriel and Indigbert are two pre-trained models that are they are exclusively for Indian languages. And even there, uh, none of the non scheduled languages are uh, actually represented. Uh, the last two are the speech uh, 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 pre trained model that's, that's called. So, uh, Indic Web to Web and XLSR. Now, the only uh, model where some of the non scheduled languages from India is represented is the Indic Web to Web language. And this is uh, actually not very surprising if you'll, uh, uh, if you'll see that uh, most of these non scheduled languages or languages with less than 10,000 speakers are hardly ever written down. So they are the languages which are used for communication but not for official purposes not for writing and so uh, they are not represented in the text uh, uh, based pre-trained models so and if, if we are really looking to uh, have system for uh, languages which are not written down then the, they should be represented in the in the speech uh, models i uh, will break down this further and uh, then, uh, of course, again, uh, this should not be very surprising. Uh, we would probably expect that uh, the languages, the, the, the non scheduled languages, even though they are represented, and if you look at these numbers, it's almost 40 60 ratio here. So, 
forty percent of the languages in Indic Web to Web is the non-scheduled languages, but not in terms of the number of hours that are implemented. Right, so it's like uh, it's, it's almost less than twenty percent of the uh, total data set is actually non-scheduled languages, and so we could break it down uh, further, and you see that the all the data that is there that has been used in training that model uh, uh the the for the non-scheduled languages it's actually all uh so it's the news broadcast that is that has been used so there are uh radio news recordings available in those languages and those are the only things that have been used for training so there is no and for further languages a lot of data has also been collected from youtube but there was non, none available for the uh, non scheduled languages. And I will look at further at those uh, 17 languages, how each of those, so we'll see that uh, it's, it's also not that the, the number of hours that for each language is comparable. So as we move further down we'll, uh, and we'll look at this, some of the languages here, so actually top four languages forms almost 50% of the data out of 17. So rest of the uh, 13 languages uh, have a total of all together. So these numbers actually represent the number of hours that has been used for training uh, in the grid to that. So um, it's, it's, uh, it keeps on, so if you look at the smallest languages here, they are uh, around 50-ish. 50, 40, 50 hours of data that is used for pre-training and all of that is news broadcast uh, data. Right, so uh, these numbers essentially represent uh, all of the data that that or uh, that has been available on the internet that has been available easily and they have been used for training. Now, if the data is not on the internet, and and hardly any resources available to other means, uh, then the only way to build resources for those languages is through primary data collection from the field. Now, uh, so as we saw, the good part uh, here is that uh, we could start, uh, one could start exploding the data that has been put out by by field linguists that they have uh, worked on, probably they have worked on a large amount of primary data, and that could be um, uh, that could probably be used, that could be included for training the models. Uh, the data is, of course, also uh, generally transcribed, rich annotations, etc. So it's, it's a rich, it's rich data that we we are looking uh, to include. Uh, but there are several uh, challenges with that. So we cannot expect to have, so the first thing is of course the quantity of data. So say uh, typically in terms of number of hours, uh, if we look at uh, data collected during the uh, during field work is, uh, is not more than a few hours of data. So maybe two hours, three hours of data, because these are all very carefully elicited data and uh, they're meant to elicit patterns of grammatical structure. So it's not, the goal was never to have huge amount of data. The goal was always to have sufficient data to write grammatical description, right? And uh, these were also again then collected through one-to-one uh, -one interaction with the speakers. And uh, the second uh, problem is that the questionnaires and the prompts uh, that has been used for collecting these data, uh, they, even though they have been put out by the linguists, they were uh, they are not you know directly implementable in the field uh, uh, in the sense that they are more like pointers for linguists so uh, what to ask how to approach the speakers how to ask questions from them so they cannot be directly used or you know the the field work situation in that sense cannot be directly replicated for collecting more data Okay, the second uh, problem is that even though we assume that a uh, lot of this data is available, uh, it turns out that if we start uh, trying to access the, uh, those data, that's not publicly available. So public access to data is uh, is is rather less. So uh, the very few data sets that are actually available as part of language archives uh, generally, 
uh, are in a format that will uh, that will that generally requires huge amounts of processing before it could be ingested for machine learning deep learning pipelines and uh, it might it might just turn out that uh, they are in a format which cannot be uh, processed uh, fully automatically a lot of times now the third thing that uh, and this becomes uh, challenging because the data that has been saved uh, that has been stored uh, out of the field work uh, is, is stored using a few uh, very popular uh, softwares and these softwares use some kind of either some kind of proprietary formats or uh, i would say semi proprietary because uh, even though so something like lift xml is not documented so you look at the the data set itself you try to figure out the structure of the xml then you try to you know uh, parse that xml and it might just turn out that in some other data uh, there is more information and then you are back to reading the xml and so it's, there is hardly any documentation for uh, my, you know uh, what those formats are and uh, so uh, again, uh, even if it's it's in some kind of a structured format, getting it directly and uh, processing it becomes a very very difficult task. So uh, the question is: Is there a way to uh, overcome this? I mean, uh, what could we do? Uh, so there are two parts to this challenge. Uh, one is how do we scale up the data collection so we cannot. Uh, directly take the field methods out of the box and also by the way the the methods that have that some of the uh, people in nlp use for collecting data from the field uh, those uh, methods are not really something that that works uh, very well so and then we have a lot of things that we could learn from field language because they have been doing it for a pretty long time. So uh, that's there. But the question is, how do we scale up? And can we scale up uh, the data collection process in the sense that uh, is it possible to collect uh, you know, large scale data or relatively large scale data using field methods uh, of language data collection? And the second is, of course, how do we uh, make the data that has been collected available in a structured way the so these two questions of course also relate to the previous question where we're trying to figure out if uh you know how could field linguists uh benefit by using nnp and can we combine those two in some way so the idea of this friendship uh, between the two fields would be that they contribute to each other in some way and yeah so is, is there a way to uh you know to have that possibility so uh there are two uh things and we started uh exploring this path and seeing how could we scale up so the first thing that we were trying to do was to was to uh to collect more data from the field in a um in a shorter amount of short period of time right and so we used uh, uh, this uh, crowdsourcing app. Now it's not a typical uh, crowdsourcing app, uh, Karya. So it's a uh, it's, it's essentially a mobile app, and the focus uh, of the app is to develop an ecosystem that could provide digital employment opportunities to economically disadvantaged sections of society, uh, which means that. Uh, but now there, there's this uh, the model of Cardia works like this. So uh, the the team of linguists or the researchers they go to the field uh, with mobile phones, etc. And if they as much as they could arrange for, and they also look for more smartphones in the in the in the uh, villages that they are visiting. They install the app. They give people training on how to work on those apps and then uh, as in other crowdsourcing uh, applications the the tasks the micro tasks are uploaded on the on the app and throughout the process uh, the 
researchers, they remain with the speakers. Now, the, the, the advantage that it provides is that we don't have to remain in the field for you know, throughout the uh, data collection process. So we could probably stay there for a week and once the speakers are reasonably well-trained and they know how to access the system, et cetera, and uh, how to do the recordings, then uh, one could come back uh, from the field and let the speakers do the, uh, 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 do the task. So it doesn't uh, have to be one-to-one -one interaction, but it's also not uh, like a typical crowdsourcing thing where we don't know who the crowd is. Right, so uh, also that uh, it allows for presenting a licitation task and micro task and multiple speakers could simultaneously record the thing. Uh, the other thing is that internet connection is uh, is is an issue. So uh, especially in the rural areas in India, and this one the app doesn't require an active internet connection. So the data whenever uh, the speakers they come to the uh, to the network area uh, the data could be synced with the server uh, there is also this idea of a local uh, box where the the box is uh, essentially uh, installed somewhere in the village and the speakers could uh, come to that place and uh, you know, sync their data with the box and box is then carried back to the location. So it's, uh, it's it's a much more involved process than crowdsourcing even though. So the only thing that it, it, it actually matches with the crowdsourcing is the, uh, is that multiple speakers could do the things and we present the task as micro tasks. Okay, so that was the uh, first thing and I'll come to the, you know, to what we managed to get out of that. Um, the second one is uh, an app that would, uh, you know, support data management and analysis. And uh, so this is where uh, we uh, developed this, uh, we're trying to develop this web-based application and uh, which kind of uh, supports the whole pipeline for doing field uh, uh, data collection from the field. So starting from questionnaire designing to you know, transcribing and annotating the data set, et cetera. And so both of these modules are then integrated with uh, Karya. So uh, essentially the questionnaires that one develops, they are converted into micro tasks automatically uploaded into Karya for data collection that, that goes to the speakers. Once the data is recorded there, then you get it back uh, on the app for further processing analysis. There are other couple of other modules one is for building the lexicon and uh, there is also where uh, so it also includes uh, 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 some kind of a gui based environment for for training so it's, it has an auto ml system at the back end and um, it kind of uh, based on whatever data one receives it tries to uh, train a model which could uh, automate some of the tasks of course initially the model performance is really bad as one would expect but it improves as more data comes so uh, yeah this is the screenshot of the dashboard as you could see so uh, a lot of things there on the dashboard but uh, essentially it it gives uh, you a way of creating different kinds of projects to be trying and working on those okay so uh back uh, we started uh, using this app so we did this uh, pilot uh, uh, you know to to test if this whole pipeline and this thing works actually in the field for data collection and if it works how how well or how badly it works so the objective uh, for uh, this was to was to have uh, to to have some kind of transcribed speech corpus and ASR for four of those uh, Indo-Aryan languages. All of, all four of these are you know, non-scheduled languages. And uh, except for Bhojpuri, we didn't really have much data for the other three languages available. And data collection essentially involved two phases, translation and narration. We'll just explain in brief what those two phases were. So, uh, so translation phase essentially involved 
presenting to the speakers one sentence at a time in Hindi, and they were required to translate those into the language and record it. And so the translations were not meant to be typed. Uh, they were to be recorded directly on that. Man, so these uh, sentences were uh, meant to be uh, meant to elicit a lot of different kinds of grammatical structures, and also from uh, different domains. Uh, not a lot of different domains, but then yeah, uh, some of the different domains that we could think of. Narration phase was. Uh, so this was the second set of uh, 39 questions, and these were uh, more like questions about uh, questions to the speakers about their rituals and traditions. So not really translations, but uh, you know, as the name says, that they're supposed to answer it in as descriptive way as possible. And uh, we expected that it would probably yield more uh, naturalistic narrative data in comparison to the translation sentences. They were also not really, uh, uh read speech data essentially but the translation that the speakers were reporting now um i'll just skip this one and so this is the uh interface for the uh data these are three different screenshots so this is the first uh one is is simply the interface which the speakers get and uh the idea is to have as little text here as possible because a lot of speakers would be using the app uh, they will not be probably uh, able to read and understand a lot of instructions so and the design choices are accordingly made also the questions that you see here so these also had uh, a, an audio with those so these sentences were actually also spoken uh, along with being written here and uh, this is simply you press the button and, and record and these were all uh, this is how the speakers were trained on uh, uh, trained during our field trip and they were required to uh, do this recording etc the uh, and there was this simple uh, steps to to sync the data that they have recorded with the server and uh, since it's a crowdsourcing app so they also and you know kind of get paid now almost instantly okay so uh out of this so we managed to collect uh, let me see so uh, managed to collect data from 10 speakers for each of the languages and from different uh, uh regions so uh, no no not for from different regions but from different uh, villages essentially within the same district uh, for all of these languages. Now, uh, so within a week's time, um, and there were four people. So there was one person working uh, on each of the language, and within a week's time, this was the amount of data that we managed to uh, the speech data that we managed to collect. Now, this is. Uh, these are the final numbers after we removed the uh, silences and pauses, etc. So this was the uh, number of hours. So on an average, we got around uh, four hours, four to five hours of data uh, in, in a week's time from from uh, ten speakers. And so uh, uh, typically, this uh, uh, in, uh, in in a field work uh, when we uh, go to the field for data collection it takes uh much longer to get the data one and the second thing is that uh, probably all of the data we ta are taken together uh doesn't uh amount more than one to one and a half hours of data so essentially using uh karya resulted in more data and uh more data for you know for each of the language so that these all kind of shows the distribution of the data set that we had for each of the languages and it was not um, that everywhere we got equal amount of data for example look at the narration data set so you see that uh, probably muggy speakers they couldn't really uh, 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 we couldn't get a lot of data from the muggy speakers for narration anyway so then uh, once the uh, data gets synced to the 
to the app for transcription, uh, there are certain things that we uh, ensure that is there at the back end. So for example, uh, there are two things that we did here. So one was uh, we integrated, uh, so one of the, uh, one of the very time taking uh, task in processing field uh, data is to uh, is to slice the sounds uh, is to slice the you know the whole recording into sentences or into words. So uh, just experimented with um, uh, VAD models, the voice activity detection models, and uh, these bound these boundaries that you see here created these were done automatically. So. Uh, this used to take hours and hours and uh, the model that we used uh, worked rather well and what was also uh, uh, you know uh, kind of uh, uh, good that the uh, the feeling which they were till then not aware that it's possible to do this automatically. So there is something called VAD uh, that is available and that one could use. Uh, 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 that, that was, uh, you know, that that was, that didn't know, they didn't know and also if they knew, uh, they were not able to use it really uh, that well. Now, the good thing about this uh, interface uh, was that uh, it managed to integrate the uh, also, it managed to integrate the ASR system, but ultimately that was that didn't kind of work because uh, none of these languages have their own ASR. We tried to integrate in the ASR that worked really bad and produced really bad transcriptions, and ultimately that has to be uh, that had to be removed because uh, it was producing a lot of uh, bad transcriptions, which were distracting for everyone working. But uh, VRDs kind of worked, and it helped in. Uh, in accelerating the whole task of transcribing uh, the data set in a more uh, quick method at the end of so i think uh, the transcription is still took a couple of weeks so in less than a month's time we had uh, uh, this data set made and the finally though so these i think more, more than 100000 tokens were transcribed uh, uh, using the app and there was this nice uh, uh, alignment between the the sentence and their transcriptions okay so yeah and then of course uh, we have this uh very uh rather simple interface where one could select the uh the name of the model one could select the the data that one is trained on and uh, with one click uh the training is done at least the basic ones with smaller data sets that's what is done so uh, to sum up uh, the whole of uh, uh, this uh, is is uh, at, uh, if we want to really uh, democratize NLP in in the sense that we want to have NLP systems for more and more languages, uh, probably uh, or certainly we need to support languages and communities of all sizes of all kinds irrespective of the number of speakers that they have. And in most of the cases, uh, the only way to ensure that is by collecting data from the field. Now, uh, we already have uh, this uh, uh, very well-established method of field methods of collecting linguistic data, which we could use, uh, definitely those methods, and we could try and adopt, adapt in some ways for uh, large scale data collection. And uh, also, uh, in turn, probably uh, all of that could be used for supporting uh, uh, the field uh, linguistics itself by making NLP techniques and models uh, available uh, to, to field linguists that could uh, only uh, make the whole task of creating the uh, data system, the field probably easier, quicker. Right, and so the two apps that uh, I presented and the, so also that I have not uh, put it here because it's still uh, an ongoing work. So we are now uh, trying to use a very similar pipeline for getting a much larger data set of around uh, 
1200 hours in six languages and those six languages again uh, are not no, four of those six languages are not uh, non scheduled and they're not written down mostly uh, so we are trying to uh, use uh, the same pipeline the same uh, set of apps for doing that and uh, we'll see how will that works out in the long run but uh, the idea is not to have the, not to use the same app but also to see how in different ways we could truly provide some kind of infrastructure applications that could help in quick collection of data and also for you know uh, better management of data that has been collected from the field i think that's it i hope i completed not too soon or not too late thank you very much timing is quite okay we have a few minutes left for, for questions if anyone has any questions i'm looking at the chats i don't see anything in the chat feel free to put it in the chat i can read it out if you if anyone wants Uh, yeah. right. Right. This, this is outside my expert way of beyond my expertise uh, but thanks for a very interesting talk and a very important subject um this might be a silly question but um do, do is there any help um looking at cognate languages um rather than regarding each language as a, an isolate you might might be tailor your questions or, or tailor your question, questionnaires to base. There might be neighboring languages that are bet, better documented cognate languages that have got certain grammatical features or semantic distinctions. And you might go looking for them rather than um, if, if you were just thinking of Hindi, they might not have these distinctions. I'm thinking about, say, if you were if Scottish Gaelic hadn't been documented, but you knew Irish Gaelic and Irish Gaelic is a vocative case. So you might um, design your questionnaires to elicit a vocative case. Is there, do, you, do you ever find it useful to look at cognate languages at all? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, and uh, so um, there is no question about that. So looking at cognate language looking at uh, languages that are typologically similar and uh, you know that that could have uh, that could share a lot of grammatical properties and we could definitely uh, make use of that uh, uh, the thing is also that uh, uh, so you know uh, i probably wouldn't say that we need to collect huge amount of uh, data for those for any of the languages uh, and uh, we could use other intelligent ways but even if we need small amount of data just if, for example to have test data sets for example right so uh, even for that and for for a large number of languages even that is not available so uh, for a small uh, we, we need to have even if we use uh, you know uh, linguistic properties of different kinds to 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 to, to build systems and we are actually trying to do that right so uh, even then we'll still need some little minuscule amount of data set in, in each of the languages uh, you know at least yeah test test data as you said yeah, but definitely of course uh, uh, by using typological properties and uh, also uh, so yeah the languages that are closely related in fact the the four languages that i talked about uh, in, in the talk they are all very closely related to each other and to hindi and that's why we were not looking to collect huge amount of data and uh, i i think i didn't present ultimately the result of the asr that we built with that small amount of data but we ended up you know taking hindi asr and then uh using lot of information from there and then augmenting that with this small data set that resulted in in i think we, we got a word error rate of less than 30 which kind of uh works in lot of practical uh places rather well so yeah
Thanks uh, the answer. I, I just had a quick question as well. Um, if you're deploying this uh, application, is it field workers who mainly use the app or do you actually provide uh, the speakers in the field, the native speakers that you are interested in? Do they do they interact with the app as well? Or is it is it kind of, are they assisted or are people, are field workers uh, doing the actual work or the... So uh, the transcription part, that uh, is mainly done by the field workers, by the linguists, but the data collection app, obviously that's, uh, that, that has uh, been used by the the speakers by the community members as well and uh, we we probably would ideally want it to be used by the by the community as well by not not just by the field workers all of it that would be the goal that that would be the ultimate goal to you know. so, so at, the, at the moment it's not i suppose it's not an app that everyone can download and use at home right or that you need some intervention with a field worker that instructs people to do um, to elicit stuff or yeah uh also theater because uh see the the thing with any kind of app is that uh a lot of uh communities that we work with they are not at all uh, used to to using digital technologies uh, in the way we use it, for example. Right. So uh, I would say that a person who is not a linguist, but who are used to, you know, uh, say using apps on mobile phones, they would be able to use it without any instruction. But if somebody has uh, are not really they have not really used say smartphones or people who are not proficient uh, with their smartphones they only use it for one or two very specific purposes so in that case uh, without the instructions people feel uh, lost and uh, they are not able to do it uh, the thing is that it doesn't require extensive uh, instructions so yeah but it still does so uh, especially for people who are not uh, you are, you know, who are not regular users of uh, mobile phones or technologies in general. Anyone else? Does anyone else have a comment or a question? Well, I suppose in that case, we, yeah. we thank the speaker for, for his interesting talk. Um, thanks for joining us, uh, I suspect, from India, where it's much later than in Western Europe. <laughs> so thanks for <laughs> it's uh, still not staying up long. Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, thanks a lot. We have, we will have, an, uh, uh, we will have Kevin Scannell next month in April, who, uh, and you will talk about Irish language technology. So um, we hope to see many of you then uh, again. So um, thanks again to the speaker and uh, all of you who joined. And we hope to see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.